Oh, you got uh, the plaque. I didn't notice that. The, yeah, see, nobody sees it. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> I think only one person in like 25 years, whatever, 20 it's too years. Too high. Yeah, <laughs> but we we even have R2000. <laughs> yeah. We got R2000. We got Energy Star because it was a new enough renovation to be considered a new building, and lead lead gold, which I'd like to get a change to lead platinum, but it would cost too much money just to get the just for them to update it. So it's technically a lead platinum building. Casey Gray here from The Conscious Builder, and today I'm excited because we are touring Ross Elliott's property. I've known Ross since we built our first certified passive house over 10 years ago, and he is the former owner of Homesall Building Solutions, which is the company that we use for all of the energy advising on our projects. The house behind me and the property that we're gonna to tour is been a, has been a labor of love for Ross over the years and he's continuously adding to it. And you will see even today, after years of working on the project, he's still adding things to it and you get to see it all firsthand here. The original building was a 1930s farmhouse that Ross upgraded and expanded. On this tour, Ross is going to share their straw bale home, which they lived in as they completed their renovation to the main home, their maple syrup shack, where they collect from about 140 trees each season, and inside their greenhouse, which was originally insulated with bubbles. They said, sure it is. But they didn't realize I'm putting it on a slope. So here's the solar collectors, and it's 10 kilowatts and these tilt four times a year. So it's usually a three person job. We get one person to hang on to here just to steady the bottom of that. And then this pin pops out of here and then put it into that hole. That's the summertime. So this is, this is the one for the winter time. Brings the panels down like that. And this is spring and, spring and fall position. And it's all balanced right on that center point right there. And this is the first year where you're fully electric, no propane, no. Anything, yeah, so you yeah we, your just, hot water uh, we got rid of the propane water heater finally. So uh, no more fossil fuels. And we've replaced that with the heat pump water heater, which I'll show you shortly. So now we have the, the two air source heat, two cold climate air source heat pumps and a heat pump water heater, and then a pellet boiler, which will run the hydronic heating system for both the straw bale building and the main building. So we'll have a look at that too. Stone wall here. Yeah, I was just about to ask about that. Yeah, that's uh, probably the early 1800s. Goes all the way back to the end of the property and right down to the road. What would they have had that there for? That's uh, which side of that? They must have farmed that side. Yeah, they would have because see all the rocks over here still. Right. right? But, so when they farmed in there, they picked all the rocks up and built the wall, wall out of it. So look at how much work went into that. Just amazing. How do you form this? I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, if you look on his website on flying, flyingconcrete.com, you'll actually see some of the work we did on this building. But the way it's done is first you start with poly pipe, like water pipe. Okay. And you bend it the way that you want these, these arches to go. You follow that with rebar and you form the rebar to, to go in that shape. Then you lay down, um, driveway mesh, like the six by six mesh mm -hmm. on top of that and form it top of the rebar. Then you lay down a double layer of diamond lath and you parge the concrete on top of that. And then you take the rebar and the driveway mesh out from underneath, you can reuse it. Now you've got the underside of the just, you've only got like an inch of concrete on the diamond lath and you parge the opposite side of it. Ah, okay. So that's how it's So done. how thick is this then? No, it's about an inch to inch and a half. I don't think that's, that's something else down there. So there's three different kinds of figs there. Yeah, we used to have rainwater irrigation. would just go down into this. Um, I mean, it's still here. The rainwater comes in there, goes into that sump pit. Okay. Pumps it up into a tank over there and then uh, drip irrigation by gravity. So when it rains outside, it rains inside too. <laughs> so, so there's the, there's the solar jetty. Oh, yeah. You see how that vent works there? It goes one way. So it's just drifting out from the greenhouse right now. You see that? But when that fan comes on, that adds, puts back pressure in here so that closes so we don't push the hot air back in through there. And then that, that's open now for the, 
for the just for the summer that'll be closed up so in the winter time when that fan comes on and blows hot air into here all the thermal mass is on the inside all that concrete is on the inside of the spray foam so that warms this up so that provides like a heated uh, space it, it stores the heat and it blows it through here and back under the door back into there so that's how we keep the heat going in the, the solar heat in the winter time. And Catherine hung all the laundry up this to make it look nice and homey. <laughs> Let me show you this water heater. Oh, why, by the way, what you're walking on right here, that's rainwater collection. See how the yeast trough? Yeah. Comes down through there and feeds that pond there. Ah. In an emergency, we could always drink the pond water and <laughs> through a filter. Through yeah, the, run it through your... Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, Good for a fire or whatever. Have a look up here. That's another heat pump right there. Yeah. So that's the Fujitsu. There's one on the back side, and I'll show you another one on the front side. So that's a cold climate uh, Fujitsu air source heat pump. That's uh, for a mini split? Yeah. Just have a mini yeah, split inside? Mini split, yeah. That's for that side of the house, and there's another one for the other side of the house. Plus, it's got all the radiant heat. I'll show you the pellet boiler next. But this here unit is uh, it's our water heater. Yeah, I'm excited to learn about how this performs this winter. Yeah, oh, and because uh, so we've far, had, I've had conversations awesome. about these, and I, and I've always told people I'm like I can't vouch for them because I don't know yet. But <laughs> yeah, well they say it'll produce hot water down to minus 25. Okay, and then it's so. got a backup, right? I'm assuming. Well, I do producer. have. I'll show you, but I've, I've got it plumbed for I could use an electric water heater if I needed to, like an on, like a seven gallon tank one. There's not one built in? No. Okay, so this just does, that's just a holding tank inside. Yeah, so if it's like 40 below zero, then you kind of have a shower. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but come on in here. My wife would not go for that because that's when she's showered. Yeah. The, put showers off. <laughs> so this is crowded as usual. Well, I think it's important though because you wouldn't have been able to put the other air source heat pump because this room's too small. Yeah. It doesn't have the volume for it. Yeah, so it'd be too small and too noisy too because it's right. Right, right in the middle of the, of the building. So this is like an 83-gallon 80, water storage tank. And I've like super insulated it. They, they told me like it was really super insulated and they said, you don't need to add any insulation. It had one inch of EPS on it. It's like, uh, that's an R4. This, <laughs> that doesn't work for me. <laughs> it's like I added like another R10 to everything. Get out of here, you little stinger bug. So yeah, that's the that's the uh, water coming into the storage there, and this over here, I had to switch out my perfectly good Van E for a Panasonic because this was so much more efficient. See this? Uh, had to. Yeah, I kind of like <laughs> talked Catherine into it at least. See, eight, eighty-three percent efficient at uh, at zero degrees Celsius. Uh, eighty-three is not too bad, eh? What was your other one? I think it was about seventy, seventy-two. Right. Something like that. So gained like 10% 10, 10 on, uh, on the efficiency of the ventilation. But this is a really sweet unit. See how the, uh, you can dial it up directly on here, but also on the main control, you can change your, your balance. So yeah, it's Panasonic all, has some nice units coming out now. Cause this can all work, be connected into those Swidget yeah. stuff as well, right? Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. they partnered with them. Yep. Yeah, so that's a pretty cool unit super efficient and then this is super efficient so that these are the last two things that we're, we can do to this house to make it efficient so that was like squeeze the last few gigajoules out of, out of the label. And this stone back here there's a story on that too. This, we got this from up in Muskoka and uh, originally I wanted to use stone but then somebody told me it's way too expensive so it was going to be like just parched okay. which would have looked kind of ugly. Because this is over top of that's an ice. This part, the curvy part, is ICF. It's an okay. R40 ICF with four and a half inches of foam on either side. Okay. So they call it an R40. Now it's a true R40. By the time I added another inch of EPS on the inside, and then uh, stone and everything, now it's really R40. They were lying a bit. It was like an R36. But uh, <laughs> why were they lying? Because that's a false advertising. You know, they kind of bend it a little bit. Yeah. They call their EPS special EPS is like 4.4 per inch. Or and then they say that there's something the concrete helps because yeah, of yeah, the thermal right. mass and all that. The stuff. thermal mass, the magical thermal mass. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I called a guy up and I said, I, I heard that um, natural stone costs the same as uh, as artificial stone. 
And he, said, he laughed. He said, where'd you hear that from? I said, oh, I don't know. Somebody told me that. So he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I was thinking of putting stone on this building, but I don't think I can really afford it. He said, well, I might have a deal for you because up in Muskoka, the cottagers that have these beautiful cottages that are, you know, done with, this is four inch thick stone, eh? Um, they don't want all these weird colors like the reds and the blacks and the they stripes the and everything. Yeah. They want to have like something that's consistent. So this was all leftovers. Like this is perfect. So we got a good deal on the stone. Nice. But then the stone was cheap, but then you know how much stonemasons cost, eh? <laughs> you ever gotten any real stone done? Yeah, we've done only one, but usually people want it and then you give them the price. They're like, okay, never mind. We yeah, well, he was here for <laughs> six weeks putting the stone on, so. It's a puzzle. Yeah, right, but look so at a nice job, eh? Yeah. It's like, here's a really good stonemason. This is a building we, we, we lived in while we renovated the old 1930 farmhouse. And that's made of straw bale. Geothermal, that's another thing we took out. Because that, um, again, geothermal is not as energy efficient as they say. Right. Because once you, once you run the pumps for the well and everything, so if we were taking it out of one well, putting it back in another, like open loop system. Mm -hmm. So the, the electricity use of the heat pump was huge. So. How much, hey. what were you expecting versus what did you get, you think? Uh, I don't know, like, it was probably costing us, in the middle of winter to heat the house with that, it was probably 400 bucks a month, yeah. which was a super energy wow. efficient building. I was glad when that blew up, because then it gave me the <laughs> excuse to put in a pellet boiler. So, so that's uh, the other thing, is they don't last that long. Yeah, either, I guess. and then there's, well, I could get it repaired, it'd be like $12,000. <laughs> For the low, like, low price. Yeah, for 12,000 bucks. So now we have pellets. Yeah, so geothermal makes uh, a lot of sense for a bigger house that has like a high heating load. Perhaps an old historical stone house where you can't add a lot of insulation and things to it. But it does use a lot, a lot more energy than an air source heat pump does. The cold climate air source heat pumps now are performing better than geothermal. That's a case of where the manufacturer's specifications are actually underestimating what they're really what they're really doing. So the cold climate air source heat pumps are outperforming the geothermal systems at about half the price for BTU. But at the same time, a cold climate air source heat pump was only good to maybe 40,000 BTU. So if you have to put in two or three, then it starts to get cheaper to put in geothermal. So big building, something you can't insulate really well, that's where you use geothermal in the future. So that's a whole year's worth of pellets on one pallet. So we've got three years worth, supposedly. I think we'll go through like one and a half. Come on in and see How my How often do you have to throw a bag in? Well, I'll show you. It's got a, a hopper that holds 18 bags. Oh, wow. So here's the pellet boiler, which is just going in. So this will, this will hold 18 bags of pellets. That's the hopper for it. And then this is a thermal storage tank an expansion tank and then we got a little electric water heater and here's where the old propane water heater ended up that's the one that came out of the house okay so that's 180,000 BTU combo uh, mm -hmm. water heater so somebody in the future not me might want to use fossil fuels again or maybe they'll use you know sewer gas or something like that <laughs> I don't know but that'll be plumbed up for a backup system for the pellets that could heat the house if I needed so to. this is all radiant tubes through here yeah which will be see, connected into that now yeah two big lines here the two yeah. big blue lines they go back to the house okay and then the concrete floor in the cafe end is uh, is all radiant actually the whole first floor is radiant because the hardwood floor on the other side is radiant as well okay so this is heating the house and yeah. this building and this building yeah gotcha. this these smaller pipes over behind the water here those two little ones there they go into the floor of this building okay and those ones go back to the main house so the upstairs has radiant walls mm -hmm. you ever seen those before so yeah. instead of putting the tubing in the floor, you put it in the wall. You need to put in about 10% more mm -hmm. uh, to get the same amount of BTUs for in terms of tubing. So we just got like wainscoting around the outside walls. And in behind that is all the tubing. So it heats the upstairs with that and the downstairs has it all on the floor. That's a good idea. That's where all our solar, pan heat solar energy comes in. From Full over circle. There in the hill. It comes <laughs> through the back of the greenhouse, taps off to the greenhouse there. So uh, runs everything out there and ends up coming through here. That's the system disconnect for the, the solar panels and runs inside the 
the panel, and then we have this bi-directional meter here. And uh, for a while I was confused, because I was looking at this and saying, um, see it comes up with another number in a second. So 65313, that's how much we've used since we uh, put, got the meter put on. 21,365, that's how much we sold back. We didn't take a look inside on this tour because Ross still has some finishing details to complete, but Ross completed a blower door test on his home. And I wanted to finish with this because high performance construction is really all about the details you don't see. And if you're planning a new build or major renovation, you really need to keep this in mind. Now, that was because it's actually supposed to be the, the foam board on the outside is supposed to be the air barrier. Um, but the thing is, you know, working with a crew, is that unless your crew is totally bought into what you're trying to do, right, they don't understand how come something has to be taped and sealed. And when they start getting into something where there's difficult corners, like up where there's the two different slopes of roof meet and everything, and they're piecing things together. I wasn't here that day probably, and that's where it leaks under, you know, it's like we put the the, uh, the smoke machine on and pressurize the building, and it comes out through the gables between the foam. It's like, ah, oh, they didn't tape underneath it well enough. But it's still 1.18 is good. It's, yeah. it's tight enough, but you know, not perfect. So I know exactly where the two leaks are, that, that gable and the far gable over there. No, don't do that right now. You're on camera. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into today's video. If you want to see more great tours like this, as well as get updated on all the cool projects that we are a part of, be sure to subscribe. And one of the best ways that you can support this channel is by hitting that like button below. If you want to get the tour of another home, you can check out this video here. Until next time, I'm Casey Gray, and remember to live consciously.